Good morning. Good morning. Um, mm. Thank you, God. I, um, I thought I was going to try to be fly with this jacket, but it's mad hot up here. So that's not going to happen. You give me the water. <laughs> Thank you, baby. Um, <laughs> praise God. That's, ah, that's, that's my better half right there. Give it up for... Thank you, love. Um, man, there's once where I did offering, and then uh, Pastor Sam came up, and he was like, he felt like I stole his sermon. And I don't necessarily feel like Pastor Randy stole my sermon, but I do feel like, like he could have just finished, and we could have had altar call. Like, that was, um, praise God for Pastor Randy. Praise God for the fire that the Lord is pouring out in this house, um, which is actually what we're going to be talking about today. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Um, We're going to be reading from uh, Numbers chapter 28, uh, verses 1 through 6, and then um, Leviticus 6, because it ties into it, um, 12 and 13. So Numbers 28, chapter 1 through, uh, Numbers chapter 28, verse 1 through 6. I really, really hope you guys are bringing your Bibles. We're going to be reading scripture today, so um, hope you're ready. So Numbers chapter 28, starting at verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel and say to them, You shall be careful to present my offering, my food for my offerings by fire, of a soothing aroma to me at their appointed time. You shall say to them, This is the offering by fire which you shall offer to the Lord, two male lambs, one year old without defect, as a continual burnt offering every day. You shall offer the one lamb in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, also a tenth of an ephath of fine flour for a grain offering, mixed with a fourth of a hen of beaten oil. It is a continual burnt offering, which was ordained in Mount Sinai as a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out, but the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall lay out the burnt offering on it and offer up and smoke the fat portions of the peace offerings on it. Fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It is not to go out. Father, I thank you for how you have been speaking today. I thank you how for how you have just offered us the opportunity to step into your presence, Lord, to hear from the very throne room what you would have for us to hear, to guide us, Lord, where you would have us to go. I thank you how you have even, Lord, confirmed what it is you want to speak today. So, God, I ask that you would remove me from the process. Lord, I pray that your word would be heard clearly, Lord, for every single one of us, myself included, we all need to hear from you, Jesus. So I just ask that you would have your way. We rely on you, Holy Spirit. We don't have it in ourselves. We need you. I need you, Holy Spirit. So come, Lord. Speak. Your servants will listen. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. Um, if I was to title the message today, it would be Fire at the Altar. Um, we are, I feel like at this point, we, we are like um, congregationally a people of revival, um, it's, it's not so much that we have to kind of get people to want to seek revival, to want to press into revival. Like, I think at this point, the majority of us are in a place of wanting revival, whatever that looks like. And we did the revival courses. We've been talking about it. We had people come. This is getting us to a place where, like, Lord, whatever revival looks like, we want it from you. And I think we also know how important the fire is that there's a fire that comes with revival, and we are not able to operate in revival without that fire, without the power that would come from that. And so I think a lot of us um, want the fire. We want to come in and, and, and get the fire and be on fire, 
go out into this world on fire, but I think it leaves a question like, how do we keep that fire from going out? Because it's not about just getting on fire, but how do we steward that flame and live our lives in that place consistently day by day? How do we keep the fire from going out? Part of the answer to that, I believe, is understanding why the fire is there in the first place. Um, you have here God giving uh, instruction to Moses to give to the people. He gives it in numbers, and it also ties back to what he told them in Leviticus. Leviticus was to a different generation. They messed up. They died out, and he's kind of going over the law again before they go into the promised land. And he's telling them about this altar and what has to be on the altar. Um, and there are many instances of altars being built throughout the Old Testament. You see it from Noah. You see uh, Abraham uh, build a few altars. You see it with Isaac. You see it with Jacob. You see a lot of people building altars, and, and frequently the purpose of it was to be a memorial. It was like God did some amazing thing. He moved. He revealed himself. And so they were like, I'm going to build this memorial to remember. Whenever we come by this, we're going to remember that thing that God did in this time. And so you see altars a lot. But most of those altars that you see do not have fire. Um, and when I was thinking about that, I'm like, man, so there's all these altars. Even after Moses, Joshua, he's building altars. They're doing these memorials. They're doing all these things. But those altars didn't have fire. And, and I, love, I love the song, um, you know, let the fire on the altar. May the fire on the altar never burn out. May the fire on the altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. And this thing about, Lord, we want there to be a fire on the altar. But we have to understand that the fire is not on the altar for the altar. The fire is on the altar for the sacrifice. It's for the offering. It happens on the altar, and the sacrifice is placed on the altar, but the fire doesn't come just because the altar's there. The fire comes when there's been an offering laid before the Lord. Many of us want to keep the fire burning. We don't want the fire to go out, but we don't necessarily want to be in that place of sacrifice. Um, you look at Elijah like, when he had the whole thing with the, 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 the 400 prophets and, or 450 prophets and he tells them to set up your altar, I'm going to set up my altar, and, and the God who answers by fire, that, that is the true God. He, didn't, he had to rebuild, and that's a whole other thing, but he had to rebuild the altar of the Lord. But he didn't just rebuild the altar and say, all right, God, come pour your fire on it. It wasn't just that, like, he made something and put the Lord's name on it. This is for the Lord. This is the altar of the Lord. Now, God, fire. He put a sacrifice on the altar. There had to be a sacrifice on the altar. It's the sacrifice that God responds to. Um, even with Noah, there isn't a, a fire response, but when Noah gets off the ark and he builds this altar and um, he sacrifices some of the animals that were on the boat with him, it says it created this soothing aroma that pleased the Lord. And so there's something about the fire and the sacrifice and something that the fire does to the sacrifice that creates some situation that begins to please the Lord. And so again, how do I keep the fire from going out? Do I understand why the fire is there? It really does not matter what any of us build for the Lord and put his stamp on it. If there is no sacrifice, there will be no fire, period. Um, and so it doesn't matter if you like, man, I got, and this is kind of like speaking to me because I'm like, yo, I, get, I like to get books, different books, you know, things about the Bible, things written by different apologet, apologists and different things. And I'm like, man, I could have every Bible translation. I could have, you know, every kind of concordance. I could, I could spend money and get all of that stuff. Um, but if I am not purposeful about, Lord, what are you calling me to sacrifice, then none of that's going to matter. Um, I could serve on every ministry, doing all the things that are happening in the house, but we can do a lot of that from our own strength and that not really be sacrifice. Um, I, could, I can pray for like three to four hours a day going in, right? But Jesus talked about, you know, don't be like the Gentiles 
who have meaningless repetition, and that, and that word is purposeful, like it's meaningless repetition, that they think because I keep doing this over and over and over again, meaningless in its saying, but I think that if I keep doing it, God will hear me. He's not. Why? There's no sacrifice. And so you think, okay, well, if I bought all the volumes and the different Bibles and all of that, well, then I spent money. Did not sacrifice money. And if I, well, I'm, I'm in every ministry, I'm sacrificing energy. And, and if I, I'm in, in prayer, you know, I'm sacrificing time. The question is, who told you what to sacrifice? You or God? We can come up with whatever we want to sacrifice. We see that with Cain and Abel. But if you did not get the instruction on what he's called you to sacrifice, then the sacrifice doesn't mean as much because he knows what he's worthy of. And he knows what you need to give over to him. And so the idea of, you know, I can get all the Bibles and do all these things, like legit for me, there's, I, I think I told Veritas this uh, Friday, I have a little bit of a, like a pride issue where like if someone says something or mentions a story in the Bible and I don't know what they're talking about, like I got to get back into it. Like I can't, I can't not know like everything's in here. And there's a like good thing to that, but there's also an issue with me just trying to look like I'm smart and know what, like there's a bit of pride to that. There's some ego to that. Maybe that's the thing I need to sacrifice. Um, you know, if you could be in every ministry doing everything all around here, but how is home though? Like, are you doing what you need to do at home? Is home the place where people are seeing you being an amazing representation of the Lord? And it's hard to get there maybe, and there's some things you're struggling with, and this person hurt me, and I got, I got unforgiveness and all this stuff, but there needs to be a sacrifice. God's saying, I'm calling you to put that, I'm calling to put your, you to put yourself on the altar in that area. We can stay in church and pray, and there is power to it, and there is purpose to it, but if we come here seeking revival and spend however long, every night, every morning, whatever, seeking revival and use that as an excuse not to live in a way out in these streets where people would see a difference that would lead us to act, like lead them to ask, wait, what, what's going on with you? There's something different. Like I can come in here and pray and get in and be at the altar and there's purpose to it and we should do it. But if from that place, I don't go outside and reflect that fire then it's fraudulent. If people aren't looking at me and saying, there's something different. You know, we was talking about this. We was talking about, uh, with somebody at work, and he was like, man, um, he's not necessarily the most, like, uh, evangelistic as far as, like, outgoing and talk to everybody about Christ or whatever, but he's been in these situations where there's something going on that everybody else is doing. They're looking at him like, but why are you not doing it, though? And he's like, because this is what my Lord leads me to do. This is how my Lord leads me to live. In that, he is showing the sacrifice. And so he's the one who has to tell us what the sacrifice is supposed to be. And this is the reality of God's people from jump. Like we have this almost like automatic ability to build things, altars, shrines, idols, ideologies, plans. We have this ability to build these things to other gods and put Jesus' name on it consistently. When Moses goes up the mountain and the people are like, we don't know what happened to this dude, even though you could just look up and see the cloud. Like, I don't get it, but we do the same thing. We don't know what happened to him, so we're going to take our earrings and our jewelry, put it in a fire, Fraudulent fire. That's a whole thing. I didn't even... Okay. Put it in the fire, melt it down, make this golden calf, and then they didn't say, okay, well, we're going to worship this new God now. They said, this is the God that brought us out of Israel. They built something that was easier for them to relate to and said, this is that same God. When Peter has this amazing revelation that Jesus is the Son of God, he is the Messiah. It's like, you, you, can, you can get that on your own. Like, the Holy Spirit had to pour that over you. And then Jesus, the thing is, Peter had a revelation of who Jesus was. He didn't have a revelation of what that meant. And so he told Jesus, well, when Jesus talks about, I'm going to the cross and I got to die, Peter's like, whoa, 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 no, you're the Messiah. We're not going to let that happen. That's not going down. And Jesus' response is, get thee behind me, Satan. You're thinking like the things of men, not the things of God. Peter in that moment thought, I, this is for God. I want to defend the Messiah. I want to do, he's trying to build. But it's not to that. Mm. Jesus calls him, he said, get thee behind me. If you look at what Satan means, it's like adversary. 
Like you're actually being adversarial in your, um, your attempt to honor God. You're actually being adversarial to the things of God because you're not thinking like the, the, the way God is calling us to think. You're thinking like men. And we see it in the epistles where this all, the, the, the writers of the epistles are warning us over and over again about false doctrines coming in, doctrines of demons coming in. These things coming into the church that will have the name of Jesus on it, but it is not truly a sacrifice to him. It's not really honoring the things we build, these altars, these ideologies aren't truly to him. Um. We need to allow the Lord to guide us in what to sacrifice and what we offer him because he is the one who decides what will create the soothing aroma for himself. He decides that. And whatever we sacrifice, whatever we sacrifice, we are sacrificing to a God. That, that could be the God of your pride. That could be the God of your image. That could be the God of your self-centeredness. That could be the God of your anger. That, like whatever we decide to sacrifice, it goes, it's, it's being sacrificed to a God. But is it to the God of Israel? Are we getting the leading about this? I'm, okay, I'm, I'm going to go off on this tangent, and I, I believe it's of the Lord. It's, it's like, okay. Um, we, I think that Christians are, for whatever reason, probably like the most prone to um, make an idol out of food because it's like we can't do anything else. It's like everything else is sin. So, but at least I can go in on this meal, though. At least I can, right, and become the, and like, if y'all know me, like, I love food. Renee already know Miss Erdie B's herself. Like, that's, that's, I'm in it. Like, whenever she got something going down, I want some, right? Um, and so, but so, so there's, and there's a place that even the word speaks about these times where, um, where uh, he is calling Israel to have feasts, right? But it can so easily become this idol that we're not willing to sacrifice. And so I keep going back to this thing and, and stuff in my face, whether I'm eating things that aren't healthy or I'm eating too much of something or I'm, uh, it's good stuff, but I'm just having to, whatever it is, it's like... I don't know if I shared this with you guys or Veritas before. Um, I, I looked up the leading cause of death in 2020. Um, reportedly, COVID was two. Cancer, uh, COVID was three. Uh, cancer was two. The number one cause of death was heart disease, um, which is primarily caused by uh, obesity, which is primarily caused by overeating and not exercising. And so I looked at it and I was like, man, you can really boil that down. Like, the leading cause of death in America was a lack of discipline and a lack of self-control, wow. which is crazy. But that isn't that supposed to be the fruit of the Spirit that we're supposed to be getting, like self-control? And isn't it supposed to apply to any area of our lives? So when I go to this thing, and for whatever reason, and there's different reasons that people find, like, food comforting and all these things, and, and believe me, like, do not let like my size fool you like a few years ago like my, my cholesterol was off the charts so like man, man like sees the outward god sees the heart my heart was struggling my heart was struggling to pump <laughs> so, so like um so I, I i believe me i'm speaking to myself as well but we'll go to these things and we'll stuff our faces and we'll, we'll enjoy it and then and then we get sick and we're like god can you heal me like i gotta pray for heal. like why don't you just stop though like that would yes i will just stop um and so when I think about, again, the idea of looking different, like the, all these things we've gotten from the world, like we're coming up. Oh, let me put it like this. I'm actually asking this question. Is there ever any time, any like period of time where God says, it's okay, like you've been doing really good. I love you. I get it. It's okay to sin right now. I'm going to give you a little time period where it's okay to sin. Is that ever, ever okay? No? Okay. Gluttony? Is sin, enjoy the holidays. But I digress. Um, so God has to be the one who tells us what we need to sacrifice. It's not us. Um, and that leads me to point number two. So, so one... 
is that the fire is not for the altar. The, ire, the fire is for the sacrifice. It's doing something to the sacrifice that is creating a pleasing aroma to God. And the second thing that I see that this makes pretty clear is that the altar should never, ever be empty. He says, this is something you're going to do continually. You'll burn this one, and then you'll burn it. Like, it's, a, it's never going to stop. And if you read beyond that, there's all the other offerings that God talks about. And he says, this stuff is in addition to the burnt offering that is continual. The, offer, the altar should always have a sacrifice on it. Um, we want a consistent fire. If we want a consistent fire, we have to submit to a consistent sacrifice. Stop trying to get off the altar. Um, if any, anybody I've talked to recently, like kind of uh, had even a, a somewhat of an extended conversation, um, I've, I've shared a lot about what my, my prayer time has been recently. And a lot of it's around like, Lord, teach me this and te- like these, these, these desires I have and I, I want these things, I want to do these things, but Lord, I need you to teach me. Um, and, and one of the other things that has happened is that usually now, for like probably like, like the last month or so, at, at altar times, whether it's at worship, whether it's altar call, I'm in a space where I'm like, Lord, please teach us how to take it beyond this moment. Yes. Like, I, I, I thank you for your presence showing up. I thank you for what you're doing in this place. I thank you for how you're touching hearts and touching lives right now. But Lord, even in this moment, I pray that you would allow our minds to align with what is it that I can do that will keep me here? Because the altar is not a moment. And we have to have that. Like when we come in, it's amazing what God can do in this space but this is not a moment. And I'm like, Lord, what happens, I believe, is that we're out there doing our thing in the world and stuff goes on and we're kind of hit by different things or whatever or we're just kind of getting lazy in the things of the Lord and we'll come here and we'll have this amazing time and we start to think that, man, I can go to church and, and have this amazing time. And, you know what I mean? Home is bad and work is bad and everything. But when I go to church, I can have this amazing time because I get on the altar and there's a difference in our desire for him in that moment But I think what's happening is that we're really being recalibrated to how things are always supposed to be. If there is a fire that rises up in you when you're in this place, that's how you're supposed to stay. It's not for here. You're getting, you're getting like this, God's like, this is where I want you all the time. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be shouting from the top of your lungs. The Lord loves that though. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be laid out on your face. The Lord loves that though. But he's going to take that. All that he's doing here and saying, but the heart of this, the fire that's coming out in this, I want to take this and affect the world with it. And you're getting, we're getting recalibrated to how we should always be. If I get to the end of an altar moment, the end of a service, and I leave out and my fire starts to dwindle and it's like, wait, 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 no, it's not just for here. You were showing me the new baseline you want me to operate from. So when I, I want to stay there and then go to the next level. Like, let it be a next thing. Let it be a new thing. I don't want to have to kind of fall in and get back to bed. And then, you know, Pastor Sam was talking about that, that idea of, uh, I think, a couple weeks ago, about, you know, we have a really, really good week and then, you know, pretty bad week and then a really, really good week and a pretty bad week. And he's like, I'm, I'm trying to keep the fire going in you consistently. But that means the sacrifice has to stay on the altar. Again, as... as I believe we are a people of revival. Um, and as a people of revival, I believe we're, we're entering into what the writer of Hebrews uh, called pressing into maturity. And he was talking about, you know, a lot of y'all are supposed to be teachers by now. Um, and we really shouldn't have to keep going over the elementary things of, of faith and the resurrection. Like, there are some elementary things. But, but if God allows, we will press on into maturity. And I believe God is allowing that for us in this time, which means that the sacrifices aren't necessarily just sin. Like, it's not just the thing that I've been struck. Like, we have to allow the Lord to take us to that place. Taryn was praying about this um, in pre-prayer. Like, those weights that hold us down. It's like the weights and the sin are easy. So I got I to gotta deal with the sin, but I also got to deal with the weights. There can be some sacrifices God is calling you to that don't match what somebody else is doing. And that's fine because it's what he's calling you to. It's not for you to get, like, I've, I've come to a place, there's a lot of stuff I've cut out. 
and then I'll, I'll, I'll see what happens when I kind of allow those things. It's, it's been a while, so whatever. I'll kind of veg out on TV. I'll do this, whatever. And I don't put those things necessarily on other people, but I know what God has called me to. And, and then it's not from like this like prideful, super like holier than thou place. He's called me there because I, don't, I can't operate in his will if I'm not there. Right? So you might be able to veg out on Netflix for a night and be good. I can't. It does not go well for me. The binging keeps going and this happens and I see, I see the breakdown that starts to happen in my relationship with the Lord and how I allow him to lead my life. And so I, ca I can't go there. That's a sacrifice that I have to make. You might not have to. But I have to. I guarantee you there are things that you do have to sacrifice, though, that might not be what your, your family is sacrificing. It might not be what your spouse is sacrificing. It might not be what your life group, but there are going to be things God is calling you to specifically and saying it's not about whether this is, quote, unquote, sin or not. It's about where I want to take you. And so we have to be willing to sacrifice those things. We have to be willing to lay them. We come here and we talk about laying things at his feet. Stop trying to pick that stuff back up. Stop fasting from things God told you give up forever. Like, I'm going to take a month off. I'm going to stay away from this for like a little while. And, you know, I'll get good and then I'll be all right. And you come back and he's like, I didn't tell you to fast from it. I told you to let it go. And then we do a good for a little while. I'm okay. And then the next sin cycle comes in. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I got to get serious about the Lord. Like, why don't you just stay there? Why don't we just... Stay in that place. Let these habits slide back in. Just as soon as we put a little distance between ourselves and our last sin cycle, we treat the pursuit. This is mad corny, but I'm going to just say it because like the, I was like, whatever, I was typing this. I said, we, we, we treat the pursuit of holiness like the pursuit of swoliness. Um, we we, like, we want to look good for the summer. Right? And I want to get like cut up and whatever, and it's going to be like, stuff's going to be a little tight. I might have the arms out. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I got... Pascal was like, I want to, uh, right? And then, you know, the winter comes, and I'm like, all right, I'm covering up anyway. Give me that burger. Like, <laughs> hoodie season. Love hoodie season, right? I don't need to, right? And so it's this, this wave of, like, I want to get really fit for a period of time, and then once it's not as important to me for whatever reason, I'm good to go back to the way things were. And we treat our pursuit of God the same way. Lord forbid that I would ever have a message to present and the day before or the week before that I'm more intent on pressing into the Lord then than I am at other times in my life. Again, that's the baseline. That's where I'm supposed to be. But I'm like, Lord, I just need you to really speak today. And then he spoke. And then I'm like, cool, thanks. Holla at you when I need you next time. The seasons of dedication. The seasons of, of devotion only when we think it's necessary. There is never supposed to be a time when the altar is empty. The image of sacrifice, is a, it's a clear sign that it does not end. Again, he's speaking to the, 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 the sacrifice on the altar continually, the fire on the altar continually. But I feel like there, there's something else that he really, like, like, like the Lord kind of makes aware in, the, in, in, in this, this pattern of sacrifice, because it says, two male lambs, one year old, without defect, as a continual burnt offering every day, you shall offer the one lamb in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And then, like Leviticus 6, uh, starting at verse 8, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, command Aaron and his son, saying, this is the law for the burnt offering. The burnt offering itself shall remain on the hearth on the altar all night until the morning, and the fire on the altar is to be kept burning on it. The priest is to put on his linen robe, and he shall put on undergarments next to his flesh, and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire reduces the burnt offering on the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. And so, man, I was like reading, and I'm like, man, we are supposed to keep, like it's supposed to stay. Sacrifice supposed to stay on the altar consistently. And he gives them a pattern for that. But then he also really points out, like, we can't do it. In our own effort, the best they could do was put something on the altar, and then it would burn and fizzle away, and then he had to bring something new. Burn, fizzle away. They had to put something new. In my own, the best 
effort that I can offer cannot keep that thing going. And it's not this thing where I think the, the sacrifice that we've put on burns away and doesn't mean as much to God. Because God, I think he shows even in the ashes, he cares about the ashes. Because he's talking about take them to a clean place. He didn't say just dump them out and throw them wherever. Like there's something. He recognizes the offerings that we've brought him. It means something to God. Anything you've left on the altar that you've presented to the Lord, it means something to him. So don't ever think that, man, I offered this or I did this and God didn't really see. God sees it and he values it. It means something to him. Even when that thing gets burned down to ashes, it still means something to him. So it's not that it loses its value to God, but I think it begins to lose its value to us. When we put the lamb on the altar, it's like, well, that's the lamb, and I could have eaten it, and I could have done this, and the thing burns down to ashes, and it's like, I guess it just, you know, it's, it, the value of ashes isn't as big to us as it is to God. Um, we're the ones who are fickle, not him. And we'll offer something, and after time, it's just like, man, I had a really, really awesome moment on Sunday, and I said I was going to give the Lord all these things, and I put it, on the, put it on the altar, and then, you know, Monday I was still good. I'm like, Lord, you can have that, and Tuesday I'm still good. I'm not going to, because that, that you know, I remember Sunday, and it meant something to me. It was special, and so, Lord, I'm not going to those sites, and I'm not going to watch this, because I know what it's going to lead me to, and then Wednesday comes, and then Thursday comes, and it's like, like our view gets so skewed from seeing, like it didn't doesn't have the impact that it did on Sunday now. And I'm just like, man. And the effect of laying that sacrifice and what that really means is just kind of fizzles out, fades away. Put something on the altar, fizzles out, fades away. Put something on the altar, fizzles out, fades away. The Lord simultaneously points to the fact that a continual, perfect sacrifice has to stay on the altar without ceasing and also points to the fact that in our own efforts, we cannot make it happen. In comes Jesus. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the form of those things, can never by the same sacrifices which they continually uh, offer continually every year, make those who approach perfect. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness, consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, You have not desired sacrifice and offering, but you have prepared a body for me. You have not taken pleasure in whole burnt offerings and offerings for sin. Then I said, Behold, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book to do your will, O God. Verse 8. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and offerings for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We are not able in our own strength and power to stay on that altar. It fizzles out, it burns away, and God says, I know. That's why I sent me. That's why I sent you, me. That's why I sent my son. Because I will be the perfect sacrifice in your stead. I will be the continual sacrifice in your place. And so we have to go to him because in our own strength, our own working, I'm messing up, this thing is happening, I keep going back to the same sites, I keep going back to that anger problem, I keep going back to that frustration, I keep going back to that greed, I keep going back to those things and I'm trying to figure out how to like force it, I, I, I just got to try harder, I got to do better, like no, Jesus has become our perfect sacrifice and it's only him who can do it. 
But he doesn't just become the sacrifice. He empowers us to go beyond our natural limitations to offer our own sacrifices to him. Um, there is a mention a lot in the Old Testament of uh, the angel of the Lord. And um, depending on how you read it or believe that, 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 so you mentioned like there's angels, but then there's the angel of the Lord. Um, and I believe it speaks to his presence, his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, people really meeting with the personal presence of God. And uh, in Exodus uh, chapter 3, we know the story, but I'll just read it. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. Moses didn't say, man, there's a bush on fire. That's okay, cool, whatever, and keep walking by. Like, it wasn't that it was on fire that caught his attention. It was a fact that that thing was on fire, but it wasn't fizzling out. It wasn't being consumed. It was not like burning down to ash. Why? Because the angel of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, was in the midst. And the only way for us to maintain the fire of God is to allow ourselves to be taken over and baptized in the Spirit of God. That is it. And understand what Jesus says about the baptism of the Spirit. You will have my power the power to be my witnesses. You will be sent out and people will see you on fire continually because my spirit is there. And the power of the spirit, again, is to be witnesses. I thank the Lord for how he's pouring out his gifts in this place. But far be it from us to seek a gift above the giver. If, if, if our seeking of any gift that he wants to give us, because it's him giving it, so it's him who decides who's going to give the gifts to. If my seeking of the gift and if it's healing, if it's tongues, if whatever it is, I'm saying I'm seeking that thing. When Jesus told them that the power was coming, he didn't say this is how it's going to look. He said, I'm going to give you power. Here's what you're going to be able to do with it. And they were like, okay, we're going to wait. And whatever you give us, we know will enable us to go be your witnesses. And so far be it from us to seek a gift, any gift, over just the presence of the Spirit that would allow us to stay on fire. Amen. Keep it up. I, I, I can, I... I I can pray in tongues all day long, okay? But if the fire of God, if I am not walking in the power to be his witness, then I'm just doing a thing and claiming that that's the power. The power is to be a witness. And so in empowering us to be his witnesses, he says, I'm going to also empower you to lay down the sacrifices that you need to lay down. And more than anything, it is you. And it's the last scripture uh, point that I'm going to read. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. If you think that God poured out his spirit on you so that you could experience some amazing thing on a Sunday, but then still have a mind set on flesh, his scripture says, if, it stays, if our minds are staying on the things of the flesh, it's leading to death. Because the mind set on the flesh, verse 7, is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his flesh who dwells in you. And so right there he begins to speak about something about the spirit being in you is going to lead you to doing something that naturally should not happen. Like your mortal body should just be dead. But the Holy Spirit is going to come in and give you life. He begins to take us beyond our own limitations. Verse 12, so then, brethren, we are, we are under obligation not to the flesh, but to live according, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs to God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. So that we may also be glorified with him. If indeed he has become our sacrifice, but when we find ourselves in him, there is freedom. We get to call out to God and call him Abba, Father. If indeed we are willing to allow his sacrifice to lead us in our own. It's not just that he did it. It's that he leads us in the ability to do every single thing he's calling us to do and to lay down every single thing that he's calling us to lay down. And so we see in Romans 12, therefore, like we know the verse, present your bodies a living sacrifice or a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. We know that's what we're supposed to do. But the full verse, like I really did not catch this until yesterday. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. You can't do this by yourself. I don't care how strong you think you are. I don't care how willing you are to, to, to say I'm going to just be steadfast against this sin and against this and that. And I'm going to be able to lay my, my life down as a sacrifice. You can't do it by anything but the mercies of God. The mercy of God is involved in this. Lord, thank you that you lead us to a place where we can be the living sacrifices that you have called us to be by your own power and by your own strength. Not by our own. But we have to rely on what he tells us in that place. If we rely on him, it requires a response from us. And it had me thinking like, Example I came up with is like, say you got a car, you just got a new car, somebody got a new car, and they don't know anything about cars. They have a general understanding. Like, it's a car, it's got a steering wheel, there's some seats, it takes me from here to there, there's an engine that makes it run, I get all that. But for whatever reason, they don't know where to put the gas. Like, I know it needs gas, but I have no idea where to put it. And so they go to someone who's an expert on cars, and it's like, you just need to know where to put the gas in? That's simple, I got you. All right, so come here. And, and look at this little, little flap on the back. So we want to open that, and then we're going to put the gas in there. And the person goes, huh. Um, yeah, no, because I, I do know it has to be in the entrance, so I'm going to just open the hood. Like, I'm going to go in here, because 
Because that makes sense to me. Like, this is where I want the gas to go, so I don't know what you're doing at the back of the car. Like, I'll be here. And it's like, but you, you don't know where to put it. And you go to the expert who wants to tell you how to put it. You're going to rely on him and his direction, but then ignore it? Why? Because the place that he's telling you to focus on, you can't see how it's connected to the place that he wants to take you? So you're just going to do what you want, even though when you came to him, and you admitted that you don't know what to do? It has to be a place where we say, Lord, I'm relying on your grace. I'm relying on your mercy. I'm relying on your power, God. And so since I'm relying on you, whatever you say needs to happen, that's what's going to happen. Whatever you say I need to lay down, that's what I'm going to lay down. And it's not about do I necessarily get how it's connected because I'm not under the car and I can't see how all. Like the verse says, trust in God, lean not on your own understanding. He will make your paths straight. Not he will make your paths understandable. Not that he will make his paths make sense to you. That he will make your path straight. And that path might be straight through a valley. That path might be straight through some sickness. That path might be straight through some hurt, through some pain, through some frustration, but your path will be straight to what God is calling you to be and where he's calling you to go. Mm, Yes, trust the process. Trust the process. And so we come before him and say, Lord, I will lay down Whatever needs to be on this altar, because I know that the fire is for the sacrifice, and the fire is only kept burning by the Holy Spirit of God. It's him and him alone. And so, as we have this altar, there's a song that I'm going to ask media to play, but not yet. Because, um, and y'all know me, I will, I go in, oh, like y'all, y'all already know. Um, but I'm, I continue to be mindful about, Lord, let us, let me, press into you, not based on emotion, not based on this, but based on a desire to lay myself down before you and to allow your Holy Spirit to lead me in being the living sacrifice that you will empower me to be. And so the altar is open. There was, a, there was about two weeks ago, Pastor Sam, uh, he was closing service, and he hadn't really gotten to the altar call yet, and I was, I was sitting there with Marlon, I was holding her hand, and I was like, we need to go up. And I started to, I was like, hey, baby, you want to go? And she was like, but he didn't, he didn't, like, open the altar yet. Like, he didn't. And I'm like, I love Pastor Sam. But I'm not responding to Pastor Sam. I love Pastor Sam. But my going to the altar is because my father has said, I need you to come to this place. There's some things I want to do in you. There's some things I want to do in your marriage. There's some things I want to speak over you. Come to me. And so that can happen in the altar. That can happen in your seat. That can happen in any place in life because that's what I'm talking about, the altar being everywhere. But I know for me there are times and getting out of my seat and out of my comfort zone and stepping to this physical place where I can say, Lord, make me the living sacrifice that you have called me to be. And so if there's anyone here who knows there's things that God has been speaking over you, there's sacrifices that he's been speaking to you and he's saying, I want that thing. I want you to lay down that thing. I know you want the fire. I, I see that you desire the fire. I see how you want to be off and, and, and burning from. I see that. But there's this thing that's missing. There's a sacrifice you haven't been willing to give me. Lord, I pray that you would lead us in that now. And again, the mindset of, Lord, it's not just for a moment. I don't just want to come here and say, I'm going to lay it down. Lord, I want to come here and get, get manna, get 
revelation from you on how to keep that thing at the altar. Like, even as I lay it down, Lord, would you teach me how to leave it there? Would you teach me how to walk in freedom? I know that there's freedom where your presence is, Lord, but I know there's some things you want to teach me as well. So, God, if you want to teach me, teach me. If there's things I need to learn, my God, then teach me, God. I want to learn it now, God. I don't want to just come to a moment of experiencing your presence and experiencing a moment of freedom without getting clarity on how to walk in that thing every single day of my life. Lord, show us how to stay on the altar. We thank you that you are the perfect sacrifice that we could never be, that you are the hope that we could never muster up in ourselves, my God. It's only by your, your grace, the fact that you love us, by your mercies, my God, that you call us to this place where we can lay down our lives because you did it first. So, Lord, I pray that as you move in this place, as you speak to people, as you start to give people game plans and lesson plans on how to walk in freedom, Lord, game plans on how to stay with this fire and to keep the fire burning, Lord, as you pour that out right now, my God, I pray that you would move in this place so powerfully and so clearly, God, that we would know that it's you and you alone who can keep us there. My own strength can't do it. My own understanding can't do it. My own gifts, my own talent can't do it. We rely on you. And in that place of relying on you, 